Okay. I've already disappointed Isabel Allende today because she said I should have a, sm a short introduction, and actually it's a little long. But bear with me. I've been working on this a bit. As a writer, I look, at, I look to Allende as a role model of someone who unapologetically calls herself a feminist and has committed herself to making a difference in this world. And she does it with humor and passion and also what seems to be with a fearlessness and stamina that is incredibly inspiring. Isabel Allende became a feminist at the age of five and throughout her youth rebelled to every form of authority, including school, church, and the police. She understood early on that patriarchy and the macho culture we live in limited the possibilities for women like her mother, someone she's called her favorite heroine in her life. She said, that it was almost unthinkable for women in her generation in Chile to be creative and successful, to even imagine being a published writer. In fact, she didn't start writing fiction until her 40s. She said, I never thought that I could be a writer because the only women writers that I knew about were all some old British spinsters that had died and had committed suicide. <laughs> the rest were just males. The great boom of Latin American literature was a bunch of men. But her mother told her that as soon as she could speak, she tortured her brothers with morbid tales that filled their nightmares. In her 20s, she started to read feminist books and realized she was not alone feeling angry about the inequities and injustices toward women and became empowered by the feminist movements abroad. One of my favorite bits that I learned while preparing to introduce Isabel tonight was that for a short while, she translated romance novels from English to Spanish. But she was fired for changing the dialogue of the heroines, so they sounded more intelligent. She even went so far as to alter the endings of these novels so the women had more urgent agency and were the kinds of women who did good in the world. I really hope this is true. <laughs> I love how Isabel Allende, in various interviews, had said that she's not interested in writing about middle-class suburbia. She's committed to writing characters living on the margins who have to overcome huge obstacles to survive in their lives. And maybe this is where I have found comfort in reading Allende's work the most. When I feel hopeless or useless in a world with so much calamity, I think about her characters facing extreme situations having to make impossible decisions. Sometimes life feels too big, but great stories, immersive, epic stories, can allow for both an escape and uplift to the spirit. As an undergraduate of SUNY Binghamton, books by Latin American, Latinx, African American women writers became my community, and the House of Spirits was one of them. Back then, I couldn't imagine I would ever be standing here introducing her. Back then, I couldn't imagine even becoming a published writer. I say this because I'm reminded by Isabel how so much can happen in one life. In 1982, The House of Spirits, Is Isabel Allende's book, became an instant bestseller and catapulted Allende to literary stardom. Since, she's published 24 books that have been translated into more than 42 languages and have sold more than 74 million copies. She's received 15 international honorary doctorates and more than 60 awards in over 15 countries and two feature-length movies. And when she was asked in an interview what she feels are her most significant achievements in her life, she said, not my books, but the love I share with a few people, especially my family. When I was young, I often felt desperate, so much pain in the world and so little I could do to alleviate it. But now, I look back at my life and feel satisfied because few days have gone by without me, at least trying to make a difference. In fact, Isabel devotes much of her time to human rights causes. After her daughter Paula died, she established a charitable foundation in her honor, which delivers care to girls and women around the world. In a 2007 TED Talk, Allende speaks on passion. And I was thinking about where I was in 2007 when I first watched Isabel Allende to do this talk. My son, who is here tonight, was about to be born in 2007. I was living in College Station, Texas, 
and the country was heading into a recession. Reports on children being detained and neglected were in the papers. It was right before the presidential elections. People were debating if the United States was ready for a woman to be president. Doesn't this sound familiar? Now, 13 years later, what she said in that talk resonates. And I want to share it with you because now I think we need her words, passion, and vision even more. She said, what kind of world do we want? This is a fundamental question that most of us are asking. Does it make sense to participate in the existing world order? We want a world where life is preserved and the quality of life is enriched for everybody, not only for the privileged. I think that the time is ripe to make fundamental changes in our civilization, but for real change, we need feminine energy in the management of the world. We need a critical number of women in positions of power and we need to nurture the feminine energy in men. Why not? It is possible. Look around in the room. Look around in the room. All this knowledge, energy, talent, and technology. Let's get off our fannies, roll up our sleeves, and get to work passionately in creating an almost perfect world. Thank you, Isabel, for being tireless in your vision and teaching me and so many readers of your work that what feels impossible is possible. Please join me in welcoming La Grande Isabel Allende to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angie. That was lovely. I, I scolded her up there and said, very brief introduction. I don't like long things. And she did something wonderful. Thank you very much. Look, I'm going to read for around eight minutes from the beginning of the book because I'm supposed to. I don't like to read my own stuff in English because I didn't write it really. It was, the translator did. Um, and usually the book is much better in English, unfortunately. The translation improves it, as I improved those translations in my youth. <laughs> so I can't complain when they betray me, I, I have to take it. Well, this is, the, it, this is the first scene in the book. The young soldier was part of the baby bottle conscription. The boys called up when there were no more men, young or old, to fight the war. Victor Dalmau received him with the other wounded and placed him on a mat over the cement floor of the Estación del Norte. The boy lay motionless with the calm look of someone who has seen the angels and now fears nothing. There was no telling how many days he had been shifted from one stretcher to another, one field hospital to another, one ambulance to another, before reaching Catalonia on this particular train. At the station, doctors evaluated the wounded that arrived by the hundreds, and each diagnosis and decision had to be made no more than a few minutes. But the chaos and confusion were misleading, for no one was left unattended. No one was left behind. The little soldier had a wound in his chest, and the doctor, after a swift examination during which he could detect no pulse, decided he was beyond all help and had no need of either morphine or consolation. On the battlefield, they had strapped a bandage around his chest to protect the wound with an inverted tin plate. But nobody knew how many hours or days, how many trains ago that had been. As a paramedic, Dalmau had to obey the order to leave the boy and attend the next case. But he thought that if the youngster had survived the shock, the bleeding, and the journey, he must really want to live. And it would be a shame to surrender him to death at the last minute. <clears throat> Carefully removing the bandages, he saw to his amazement that the wound was still open and was as clean as if it had been painted on his chest. He couldn't understand how the bullet had shattered the ribs and part of the sternum and yet had left the heart intact. Having worked for nearly three years in the Spanish Civil War, Dalmau thought that he had seen everything, but he had never seen an actual beating heart. Fascinated, 
he watched the final, increasingly slow and sporadic pulsations until it ceased completely. And then the little soldier finally passed away without a sigh. For a brief moment, Dalmau simply stood there, contemplating the red hole where the heartbeats had ceased. This was to be his most stubborn, persistent memory of the war, that 15 or 16-year-old boy, still smooth-cheeked, filthy with the dirt of battle and dried blood, laid out on a mat with his heart exposed to the air. He was, never ever, ne he was never able to explain to himself why. He inserted three fingers of his right hand into the gaping wound, gently grasped the organ, and squeezed it rhythmically several times, quite calmly and naturally. For how long, he couldn't remember. Perhaps 30 seconds, or perhaps an eternity. Suddenly, he felt the heart coming back to life between his fingers, first with an almost imperceptible tremor, soon with a strong, regular beat. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I never would have believed it, said one of the doctors who had approached without Dalmau noticing. He called over two stretch bearers, ordering them to rush the wounded youth to the hospital. This was a special case. Where did you learn that? He asked Dalmau as soon as the men had lifted the little soldier on the stretcher. His face was still ashen, but he had a pulse. Victor Dalmau, a man of few words, told the doctor in a couple of sentences that he had managed to complete three years of medical studies in Barcelona before leaving for the front as an auxiliary. Yeah, but where did you learn that technique, insisted the doctor. Nowhere, but I thought there was nothing to lose. I see you have a limp. My left femur, Battle of Teruel, is getting better. Good, from now on you will work with me. Your time here is wasted. What's your name? Victor Dalmau, comrade. I'm not your comrade, call me doctor. And don't even think of any familiarity with me, understood? Understood, doctor. The same goes for me. You call me Senor Dalmau, but the other comrades aren't going to like this a bit. The doctor smiled to himself. The very next day, Dalmau began to learn the profession that would determine his destiny. Together with everyone else at the Sant Andreu and other hospitals, Victor Dalmau heard that the team of surgeons spent 16 hours resurrecting the dead boy and that he was brought out of the operating room alive. Many called it a miracle. No, the advances of science and the boy's constitution of an ox claimed those who had renounced God and his saints. Victor promised himself he would visit the boy wherever he was transferred, but in the chaos of those days, he found it impossible to keep track all over of all the encounters and failures to meet of those present and those missing, of those living and the dead. For a long while, it seemed as though he had forgotten the heart he had held in his hand because his life became very complicated and he was occupied with other urgent matters. But years later, on the far side of the world, he still saw in his nightmares the little soldier. And from then on, the boy visited him occasionally, a pale, sad ghost with his heart on a platter. Dalmau could not recall or possibly never knew his real name, but for obvious reasons, he called him Lazarus. The little soldier, though, never forgot the name of his savior. As soon as he could sit up and drink water on his own, he was told about the feat performed at the Estación del Norte by an auxiliary who had brought him back from the land of death. He was assailed with questions. Everybody wanted to know whether heaven and hell really existed or had been invented by the bishops to instill fear in people. The boy recovered before the end of the war, and two years later, in Marseille, had the name of Victor Dalmau tattooed beneath the scar. Thank you. Thank you.
first of all, thank you for doing this, Sanji. Okay. Thank you so much. I feel honored. This is amazing. Um, I, I want to start with, um, this is your 20, wait, is your 24th published work. What? I don't have unpublished work, by the way. <laughs> All is published. Everything is published. Everything. I love that, yeah. Even my private life is published. Uh, <laughs> yeah. After so many stories, like, where do you keep finding the inspiration? The world is full of stories. I'm surrounded by extraordinary people. Through my foundation, I meet women, especially, who have ha are survivors of extreme circumstances. And I get to hear their stories. I also plagiarize from other books a lot. <laughs> now really, what are the books? I want to do the research. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a list. <laughs> so tell me about your foundation. I mean, since you brought it up, the work that you're doing with your foundation, you started it I started a number it of years after ago. my daughter died. Paula died in 1992. And then I started this foundation that wasn't going anywhere. It was just sending checks here and there <clears throat> until I found Lori Barra. Uh, my intention was not to have someone to run the foundation. I wanted a bride for my son. <laughs> um, and then, it, as it happened, she was perfectly qualified to be both the bride and the director of the foundation. You're a very good matchmaker. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the only time it has worked. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't even work for me, you know? And. Um, and so she gave it a mission, she organized everything, and now it runs smoothly. And we, if you Google my name, the first thing that comes up is the foundation and you will get to see the, the work we do. People ask me all the time, how can we donate? Don't donate to me. Go to the list and donate directly to those organizations that we are helping. It makes it much simpler. Mm. So, um, the book, A Long Petal of the Sea, is a story that you've been carrying with you for 40 years? Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a story that <clears throat> I heard first when I was probably little in my grandfather's house because um, the ship arrived in Chile, in Chile, the Winnipeg, the ship of the, of the refugees, arrived in Chile in 1939. And I was born in 1942, so that's very, it was very soon after. And some of those refugees were friends of my uncle, and I lived with my uncle in my grandfather's house. So we, I got to meet some of them. But of course, they didn't make any, except for the fact that they had a different accent, they didn't impress me in any way. But many, many years later, when I was living in exile in Venezuela, I met a man called Victor Pei Casados, who was one of the passengers of the ship, who had arrived in Chile in 1939 as a, as a refugee and now was again a refugee for the second time in Venezuela after the military coup in Chile. He was older than me, but we became very good friends. And, when I, and I carried his story for many years without the need to write it until this theme of displaced people is in the collective consciousness. It's in the air. And so it, it, it seemed... Uh, that it was knocking at my door and saying, time to tell the story. So it was a book that was very easy to write because the research was easy. It, it's recent history. There's a lot of documentation, even photographs and movies and everything. And I had a model, my friend Victor, who inspired the character in the book. I just had to type the whole thing. <laughs> it was great, yeah. No, I, I read how um, you go to your studio, you have a ritual. What is your ritual? Well, that's the first day. I don't have a ritual every day because it's, it's, the, the ritual involves to burning sage. Have you smelled sage? Mm -hmm. It's awful. <laughs> and then it impregnates even the dogs. Everything gets that horrible smell. And so I do that because supposedly it cleans the air from bad spirits. I don't believe in that stuff, but I don't believe in antibiotics either, and I still take them. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I do that, and I light candles, and I pray. I have my little altar there. And I call the spirits to see if they can come and help me. Because writing, every book is a new adventure, and writing is always scary. To get, and, and I'm sure that you feel the same way, that when you start something, you don't know where it's going. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you're going to be able to write it, if you're going to be able to have the energy to finish it. 
to travel with a book for months, maybe years. So it's always scary. And I need all the help I can get. But you know what is lovely? That now some people know that I start all my books on January 8th. So on January 7th and January 8th, I receive hundreds of messages from people from all over wishing me luck, saying that they have, they have a prayer for St. Jude, they have lit a candle or whatever. It's nice. <laughs> so I feel all this energy that is coming and it's very nice. Do you, um, so I had spent some time with Julia Alvarez and oh. she has said to me that she doesn't like email or she doesn't use her phone because it corrupts the tool of her creative expression. So she uses very limited time in those things. Like, what's your relationship? Because I've read that you spend, you go in and you just work for long amounts of time. Yeah, but I have a lot of help. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter-in-law, Lori, who is my boss, and my son, who is my <laughs> other boss, they, they handle everything. They, they handle the social media, and they, they, and they don't filter the emails. They give me everything, and every day, I answer all the emails because if someone has written to you and find your, found your address, it's because it's like someone sh extending a hand and you don't shake it. So I answer always the first message. I can't keep a correspondence with everybody, but I always answer. So that takes some time, but I, I'm good at it. I'm fast, and and I uh, and that's the time when I connect with my readers. It's a very emotional time because I get incredible letters, people who have called their, their daughter, Paula, because of my daughter, or, or people who, a lot, you know what I'm getting now? I'm getting um, messages from young men who say, my, my fiance uh, is your fan, she loves all your books, and she broke up with me. Can you please send her a letter and tell her? <laughs> that? I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. Can you please con contact her? And they give me her email or her phone number so that I will call her. And others say, can you make a, a video and say, tell her that she has to come back with me because I'm the right man for her? I get that. And no, do you no, do not one, ma several. And have you done it? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a novel <laughs> waiting to be written. I love it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, like one of the things I, I'm really inspired watching you throughout the years is how passionate you are. Like you sustain this passion for life. And I read that you say yes to all the invitations that come to you. Can no, you? no, no, I no, no. I, I'm no. passionate about life, but I don't accept invitations at all. No. Very few, <laughs> very few. I, I'm not a very sociable person. Mm. And uh, I don't like people. <laughs> I like dogs much better. So uh, it's an effort for me to be with all of you guys here. <laughs> There's a lot of people. <laughs> but do you, so, but, so then how do you sustain the passion? I think I'm very hyper and I'm also uh, very healthy, which helps. Um, I might still have some hormones, I suppose, <laughs> because you never know, but, but I suppose I might have some hormones because I'm still passionate about life and I'm, st I'm, and I'm in love, you know? At my age, I'm passionately in love. So, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this because my husband is here. <laughs> Usually when he's not around, I'm very sarcastic. Um, well, this is why you write these amazing love stories. I mean, like Rosa, Rosa and Victor's love story is unconventional, but it's about partnership, right? So um, I'm wondering, do you have advice about finding love or, yeah, staying well, in love? Don't chase after lo love too much because then you don't get it. <laughs> but what I, what I keep saying, young people who, who talk, ask me about this is, you have to take risks. You know, people go in match.com and they date and, and they want, What's there for me? What am I going to gain from this relationship? How am I going to be happy? What are you going to give? What, what, what are you willing to do for the other person? And, and how many risks are you willing to take to make this thing work? Uh, to give you an example, I will, I'm sorry, Roger. I will have to, 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 to explain. Um, 
I, I have had two previous marriages, long marriages, two long marriages. <laughs> one 29 years and the other one 28 years. I, I, I was in love and I tried to keep it working for like 20 years. The other nine years and eight years were a waste of time. <laughs> and, but I didn't know that at the time. When you, I look back, I said, what was I doing for God's sake? And um, then when I divorced at 72, after these 28 years with Willie, I said, okay, from now on, I will be alone. People would say, oh, but you're so brave to divorce at 72. Well, it takes more courage to stay if something is not working. Mm. So um, I sold the big house that we had, moved to a little house with thinking I will live here alone with my dog and write, which is what I love. And then this guy, an attorney in Manhattan, heard me on NPR and emailed my office because he doesn't like what I said. And uh, my assistant answered, and then the next day he wrote again, then I answered, and he kept writing every morning and every evening for five months. This is a stubborn person. Over email? Over email. We never met until I came to New York because I had to do something with Planned Parenthood. And then we met. And he invited me out for dinner. And I was sitting there thinking, what am I doing here? And, and then I said, look, what are your intentions? Because I'm 72 years old, I don't have any time to waste. <laughs> and you know what? This is a man willing to take risks because he, he choked on the ravioli, but instead of... <laughs> <laughs> but instead of escaping, as I would have escaped, if someone would have attacked me like that, um, he stayed. And then three days later, he wanted to marry me. The poor guy didn't know what he was getting into. <laughs> and then we started dating long distance, which is wonderful. Because, <laughs> because you idealize the person. We would do, for example, we would FaceTime. And so we would FaceTime he in, in Scarsdale and me in in California, where I live, in Northern California. So we would decide, oh, today we eat fish. And so we would have dinner together on FaceTime with the, with the <laughs> phone there and candles, and we would eat fish, and we would have prepared the fish. And the, so it was very romantic. And eventually, Roger sold his house, gave away everything it contained, and moved to California, which for him is like Africa. He was born in the Bronx and has lived all his life in, in New York. So he was willing to take a risk. And I was willing to take also the risk of having this unknown guy come and live in my house with one bedroom. <laughs> so it's working. And then we got married. So it's really working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this is a very, my mother's also in the audience. I think it's a very inspirational story. Why, is she in love with someone? No, but you know. She's looking for love. She's so now we know. Oh. Just... Lady, go on NPR. <laughs> <laughs> that works. This is the secret. We have to get on radio. Yeah, you have to get on radio because match.com at our age doesn't work. <laughs> what, what, can I, what would be my profile? Short, bossy, Latino grandmother? <laughs> who, who would reply to that? Nobody. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so you co-founded the first feminist magazine in Chile in the 1970s and have always been outspoken for women's rights throughout your career. Um, and this is such an amazing moment in Chile where oh, women yes. are coming out and with the performance, using performance and art as a way to sort of amplify if this you moment. have not seen it, look for it in your phone because it's incredible. Four young women in Valparaíso in Chile came up with this song that went viral all over the world. And the song is, it doesn't matter where I was or what I was where, the rapist is you. And this has been translated to every language. It's in, in Turkey, in Finland, everywhere. Women are out in the streets performing this thing. And among the many protests in Chile that are really have been, people have been protesting in Chile since October. And there has been a lot of vandalism and violence, but also real demands for the, for the 
population to change things, change the model. And, uh, and the, the, the women's movements have been very important. Yeah, it's a, I think the collective is called Las Dinas, am I right? The, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so they, yeah, it's really interesting. And, um, and I'm so happy that they're coming to the United States actually to they do it are? for the World March. Yeah, for the Women's March. I'm so in happy. In Washington, D.C. Yeah, be and because I know that, that for that march, they are preparing the, the song and the dance because all this is like a, like a choreography. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really interesting to see all these young women dancing and the police with the guns like this, like that, they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So with, you know, I mean, this is happening in Latin America and I feel like we're here in the US looking at Latin America and what's happening, like with what just happened in Puerto Rico and, you know, and the people came out and yeah. really changed things. Like, what do you think could help, as someone who's been an activist for so long, unify us globally? Um, well, I, I've always thought that we should have a political party of women. I mean, a women's political party, and women should vote in bloc. And women should, and, and not only in the United States, in the world, women should vote for what con is convenient for them and their families. And not ideological voting, but look at, look at what is proposed what you want for yourself and your family. That would be such a powerful movement that nothing could stop them because we are majority ladies. We are 51% of humanity. <laughs> Doesn't look like it, but we are. I know some of the surprising things when I was reading your book and I was looking at, you know, just the statistics of women around the world, like things haven't really changed dramatically. Oh, they have. I mean, they, do that. You feel like they've cha changed yes. in what ways? The, the ch things have not changed as fast and as vastly as I thought when I was struggling for feminism in my twenties. I thought that the patriarchy would collapse in a matter of ten or fifteen years. No, it will take a century, but it will collapse eventually. And uh, in my lifetime, I have seen the feminist movement uh, evolve and there has been backlash, and there have been times when young women feel that saying, I'm a feminist, is like not sexy, so they don't realize that they have a lot of privileges or a lot of rights that their mothers and grandmothers obtained for them with a lot of struggle. And that unless that is extended to every woman in the world, it's a very fragile movement. It can be overturned any minute. So I, I keep telling young people, get involved, get involved. And, and now I see the, this new wave of young women who maybe don't call themselves feminists, but they are doing the work. And, and other people have joined them. LGBTQ, all those movements have joined them. And many young men too. So that's great. The old men, you have to wait until they die. <laughs> they, yeah. Yes, they have to die off because there's nothing you can do with them. <laughs> but they do die. Everybody dies eventually. <laughs> I, I'm exaggerating. There are a few <laughs> that, that you can rescue from the darkness. I guess the, fe the change feels slow. It like feels slow uh, when you see it. In, uh, if you see the, the movement historically, it isn't that slow. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on what's happening today, it seems slow. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm often asked, I don't know why people ask me this question, in because, ah, because I write historical novels. In which time would you have liked to live? And my answer is always in the future. Because in my lifetime, I have seen the world change for the better. No past time was better than now. And now it doesn't look too good but it's better than it was before. Yeah. I think the, in the conversation of climate, you know, in the, the what we're facing, this very scary moment <coughs> where we're seeing the impacts of climate in our lives and there's all this displacement yeah. because of it. You know, a lot of people talk about immigration, but they don't talk about climate the with causes, immigration. They don't talk about the causes of immigration, right. that now we have to add the environment but, but the causes are poverty and violence. Who would leave their home, their family, everything that is familiar to them, and take the risk to go to another place where possibly he or she will be received 
with hostility, if they are received at all, only because they are desperate. There's no other reason. So when we think of migrants and refugees and people asking for asylum and people who are displaced, we, we think of numbers and statistics. That doesn't mean anything. Behind each number, there is a person with a face and a name and a story and a reason why he's, he or she is there. And, and working with migrants in the border, we get, I get to see and hear a lot of stories. <coughs> I don't personally do the work, but I get to know their stories. And then it, it, the whole thing changes. The moment the, that you hear the story, then it's not the other. It's, it could be you. It could be your child in a detention center for kids. There's a detention center, which is really a private prison for babies in this country. And we are paying for it. Well, you know, that's one of the things I, I loved when I was telling you earlier about um, a long pedal of the sea, when I was reading that scene where Neruda shows up. <coughs> By the way, um, I, I'm going to inject this here. Neruda's debut in the United States was here on this stage. Yes, yes. In 1966. Um, but where he ha is, is, is um, saying, I have to make a decision about who's going to get on this Winnie Pike. And, and I was thinking how it must have felt like the end of the world during that war. Like it, it must have felt. It was a terrible time. And these refugees, the civil war in Spain ended in January of 1939. And the war, the Second World War started on September 3rd of the same year. So the war was already there, brewing, ready to explode. And uh, Spain had been the place where, uh, where Hitler tried many of his new weapons and, and bombs and, and the Condor uh, planes destroyed whole cities, helping Franco in the, in the process. Uh, for example, the, the famous painter, the painting of Picasso, Guernica, which, he, which Picasso painted because of the destruction of the city of Guernica in the Basque country that was completely destroyed and the people who escaped, escaped to the forest and they threw incendiary bombs in the forest to kill the survivors on the other side. And so that, that was happening with, with German weapons in, in Spain. So it was a, a terrible time. When I say that all pastime was worse, I was born in the middle of the Second World War when there was no declaration of human rights, no United Nations, no feminism to speak of, no uh, workers' right, rights, no, nothing of, of what we have seen in, in my lifetime. So that, it was the time of the Holocaust, of the atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So the, the past was pretty awful, and that was a terrible time. So do you, when you write <coughs> these books in set in this history, what do you hope readers take away from it? Nothing. <laughs> I, no, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not writing to deliver a message or to convince someone of something. I want to tell a story because the story is important to me. I care for it. And I don't write about things I don't care for. So of course, the person I am and what I think and what I believe and how I feel is between the lines but I'm not trying to preach. So when the, what, what do I want the readers to take out? The reader doesn't take out anything that is not already inside. Mm. Uh, you, why do you cling to a sentence in a book or to a song or to a work of art or to a painting? Because it somehow echoes something that already is in you. And if you don't have that in you, you can preach forever and it won't make any difference. What it was your favorite character to write about? Zorro. Why? Because I was thinking of Antonio Bandera. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I read about your love of Antonio Banderas. <laughs> well, the truth is that Zorro has owners because there's something called Zorro Productions that owns the character. And when they came to me to ask me to write about Zorro, I said, why me? And they said, well, because you've written historical novels, because you are Latina, because you live in California, because he's a la sort of semi-Latino Mexican hero. And so um, I said, no, I don't write on commission. 
And then I started thinking of Antonio Banderas. And what if, what if if I get to see him? And sure enough, in the premiere of the movie, I got to meet him. Well, I had met him before, but I got to really smell him. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Do you remember the smell? Yeah, unfortunately, he's now promoting some kind of perfume that is awful. But his natural odor is pretty nice. <laughs> I love that. I love that you said that you like Sordo because he's a, a, like a superhero without special powers. He has no special powers, but he, he's passionate, he's funny, he's athletic, he, he fights for justice, which I think is wonderful. And, and also he's very seductive. I can, Im I can very well imagine Sordo climbing the, to the balcony of some lady with his mask. And then there is no guilt because you didn't see the guy. You, you, he was, you, didn't, you don't even know who he was. I, I, oh, I would love if that something like that happened to me. Can you imagine? It would be wonderful. I mean, you've done Although if, if a masked guy climbs my balcony, maybe I would be terrified that he's a terrorist or somebody. I think it could be scary. Um, <laughs> you've done so much um, already in your life. Um, what is still some of the things that you want to accomplish? I wish, I wish I won't have to divorce again. <laughs> that would be a nice wish. <laughs> well, I won't have time because I, I, as I told you, my relationships last relatively good for 20 years. I don't have 20 years. Maybe I have five, six, so. No. No. Well, we don't know. You have a lot of energy. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> well, but maybe he doesn't. Uh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I hope that's not the case. You know, I, I'm terrified of being a widow, but my mother always wanted to be a widow. Not always. I, no, 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 not always. I would say that in the last 15 years. And they, they, they were together for 70 years, which is, to me, amazing, because they had a terrible relationship. And uh, my mother wanted to be a widow so badly that she had her widow dress, a black morning dress, hanging in the closet for 15 years with the shoes and the purse. And, and I said, Mom, this is so dated. You need to, to, to change it for another dress because this is so dated. I said, just li li leave it there. Don't touch it. One day, I will, I will wear it. And then when she was dying, I said, Mom, you, you can't die because you, you are not a widow yet. And she said, well, you don't not always get what you want in life. <laughs> <laughs> and my stepfather died three months later, calling her. Uh, wow. So I have a feeling there must be a lot of writers in the room, as usual, at, when I go to readings. What is the best piece of advice you can give them? I would say that you have to work hard, uh, train, write, write, write. Doesn't matter how many drafts. Don't show it to too many people because then you get too much input. Um, sh once you have something that you think it's finished, that is good, then try to find one person that you trust to confront the text, find a good editor. But it's also a matter of luck, as you know. So many people write wonderful books that don't even get published. So it, there's, there's luck like in everything else. But discipline, I mean, people, if you're sitting there waiting for inspiration, it, it doesn't come. Inspiration comes in the process. When I start my books on January 8th, I don't have anything. I, I just have the intention of writing. And I sit there and I struggle with, with the computer because I don't have the characters. Maybe I have a time and a place that I have researched, and the research gives me a lot. But I don't have a story. The story comes as I sit with the story. The characters become people as I sit with them. Do you sit thinking, or do you actually? No, I write, write, write. You just I write, face write, write. it. And, and now I can do that because I work with a computer. Before, you were a typewriter, you couldn't do that because you, you couldn't correct as we correct now. So you've never handwritten? Well, when I was young, mm. because my first book, The House of the Spirits, I wrote on a portable typewriter. Um, and I mean, at the time, cut and paste 
was cut with scissors <laughs> and faced with scotch tape. That's how it was done. And um, I've told this story many times, but uh, when I, my mother read the manuscript, she said, how could you give the villain your father's name? I never met my father, so I, I, I didn't even remember his name. So it was just a Freudian slip that I gave the villain the name. So I said, oh, don't worry, mother, we are going to change it. Yeah, try to change the name. Today you press a button and it's done. Then I had all the family sitting on a row on the, on the, at the dining room table with the manuscripts, 560 pages. And th they would go page by page with a ruler, line by line like this, looking for the name. And if they found the name, they would give, they would pass the, pa the page, someone would put Tipex, the other one would blow the Tipex to dry it, and then I would put it in my, in, in, the, in the typewriter and write the name in the space, the new name, which had to be one letter shorter than the real name so that it would fit in the, in the damn place. <laughs> and that's how it was done. So you had to think before writing. Now you don't have to think. You just type. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you change it, and you change it a thousand times. You really needed a community. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I <laughs> needed that work. Yes. Um, and then I remember my, my son, who was very young at the time, he read the manuscript and said, Mother, you have some characters here that are 18 in page three, and 70 years later they are still 18. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he had a chart where he had all the, the characters and their, and their date of birth and what was happening in the country and in the story. And, and, and that's how I could correct the book to, to make it work, because it was just a mess. So even if it was unusual for women to write fiction, for a lot of your youth, your family was completely supportive of you writing? No, my family didn't even know. I, uh, no. And uh, women were writing always in Latin America. They didn't have the exposure and the, and the reviews and the being taught in universities like the males, because there was a sort of conspiracy of either silencing women or diminishing their value. Um, let's say, to give you an example, Garcia Marquez writes a book called uh, Love in Times of Cholera, which is a beautiful book, a beautiful book. If a woman had written it, it would be a sentimental book. So uh, the women had a lot of um, challenges. First, to be heard, to be published, to be taught at universities, to be recognized, uh, while men didn't have to go through that process. And then they are judged very, very harshly. If you put an adjective to literature, if you say literature, you think of a white male. If you put an adjective, if you say young adult literature, African-American literature, women's literature, it diminishes it. It's always less. What is up there is the male's white male standard. It's still true. It's unfortunate. To a certain extent, extent, but yeah. less because more and more women are writing beautiful books that are very successful. Yeah, it's difficult to hide now. The, yeah. the fact that they're strong women writers. Um, what, okay, so January 8th passed, but um, <laughs> did you start something new or I is tried. something, is there a seed of something? I tried to, to start something new and, and it's good that I opened the computer into something. But then I had the book tour and I've been traveling. And last year was a strange year, a year of three deaths three funerals and three weddings. So it was a very busy year. And this year I'm doing the tour, so I hope that by March I will be writing again, God willing. But did you do your ritual January 8th? Yeah, the sage is still infecting the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so there's like a fun um, lightning round series of questions. No, don't. You don't want to do it? I hate it. When they ask you questions that you have to answer, cha 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 cha, and, and you say all kinds of stupid things. Well, you can answer them not like that. Like, why do you know? I'm actually curious. Do you watch TV? Only uh, movies or good movies that people have recommended with Roger in the evening sometimes. But I read my, the news in my phone 
and I'm not obsessed with the news and I don't follow everything. And I try to avoid long TV series because then I can't write. I'm <laughs> obsessed with the TV series. Yeah. So what do you do when you're not writing? For pleasure. There is no life without writing. Now that, I, that I'm with Roger, when he comes home, we have a few, some time for us, but most of the time I'm writing. That's my job. Okay. I don't have hobbies. You don't have hobbies? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't have hobbies. I don't, I don't do sports where other people have muscle. I have cellulite. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't have obsessions of any kind. I don't collect anything. I want to get rid of everything. So I'm very boring, really. <laughs> What's the other question that you have there? The, w the one? <laughs> Well, okay, let's see. Um, I don't know. What? Oh my God, there's all these questions. Now they came. You don't have to read them all. I don't even know what time it is. I, I don't see the clock. There is no clock. You told me there was a clock. Oh. What? There was supposed to be one here, but I don't see it. Okay. Do you uh, have a watch? No. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm the timekeeper. I have no watch. She's the timekeeper. Míralo ahí. Okay. I love it. Right. It's very expensive, huh? so I'm going to be very careful. No me lo llevo. No me lo voy a llevar. Te lo puedes llevar si quieres. No. I was curious, why don't you read in Spanish when you do your tours? Do you like reading in Spanish? Or? I, I prefer reading in Spanish, but half the audience, or more than half, doesn't understand the word. And I was here in this place not long ago with a Chinese writer who spoke very little English, and he read for 25 minutes almost in Chinese. And it was excruciating, the whole thing. <laughs> so I said, no, I just can't do that. <laughs> okay, so these are some questions that are coming from the audience. Um, audience members are here. Um, okay, let's see. I'm going to see what they say first. By the way, this is whiskey. <laughs> huh. oh, oh, I like this one. So this is at the beginning. So was it true that you changed the endings of those Romance novels? I was fired. Yeah, so but you it did didn't, it? It didn't last very long, my job as a translator. Oh my God, I love that. So anyway, <laughs> it's saying um, here, um, that was one way of rebelling, risking your job. Um, what would you, how do you rebel now? What would rebellion look like now for you? Well, right now I'm in a stage in my life that I don't have to rebel because I don't have a boss, except my daughter-in-law. Um, I, I have, I rebel against the world in, in my writing, in, in the activism I do in the foundation. I rebel against everything that I hate in the world, injustice, inequality, how unfair things are for the majority of people. Uh, you know, this is something that, that is easily explained when you see what happened in Chile. Chile in October um, raised the, the fee of the subway in, the equivalent of 15 cents. And some students broke the station and the next day, a million people were marching in the streets. The, the, there was accumulated anger at the inequality and injustice of the system, a neoliberal system imposed by the dictatorship of Pinochet 40 years ago that uh, created an economic model in which everything is privatized. So the water you drink belongs to somebody. And he can ask any price for whatever for the water you're drinking. The same with education, with uh, um, transportation, health, everything is private. And many people, 40% of the population, can't pay for basic services. And so people rebelled against the inequality. And, and I would have rebelled too, because the, I think that we need to protest. We need to go out in the streets and make our voices heard. And see, we don't like the world, the world as it is. That's why I admire Greta Thunberg so much, this 16-year-old little girl who goes there and talks to the world and says to all these old farts, she says, <laughs> you are ruining the planet where I will live. You will be dead, but I will be alive. I know, these young kids who are disgusted with us, they're like disgusted. They're like, yeah. do something. Yes, do yeah. something. Yeah. 
I, um, but they are doing it. They they are coming out. I know. I lo what I love also about Greta's position is that she actually just showed up and did it by herself first. Yeah. Right. And then people modeled yeah, her. People so, followed. Yeah, they followed her, which I think um, again going back to your love for Zorro, this idea that you don't need a special power to make dramatic change. You no, just usually, have to want to make change. Usually one person has started all right. the changes. Right. So, and it's true also with what's happened in Chile, right? There was like a definite thing that hurt people. Yeah, then, but the, the thing that in Chile there are no leaders, no, no faces for this. Mm -hmm. It's just a faceless protest. Of course, there has been a lumpen and, and vandalism that that has um, used this, this unrest and this anger to manifest their own anger. And they, they have burned buses and churches and whatever. And that is, of course, not, nobody approves of that. But the protests in general have been very peaceful. Um, so someone's asking, they said, when I read House of Spirits as a teenager, I realized I wanted to be a reader and writer. What is the book that did that for you? I don't know. I've always read many, many books. I, I'm a, an avid. I'm avid for stories. I love storytelling, we, to be told a story. So I, I don't know, but I am the, belong to the first generation of Latin American writers who grew up reading the great names of the boom of Latin American literature, because for for my generation they were already well distributed in Latin America. Before, uh, Octavio Paz would be writing in Mexico and Jose Donoso in Chile, and unless somebody carried the book, you, you didn't have a chance to read them because they were not published in Chile or in, in Mexico. But then the, the publishing houses in Barcelona picked up these names, these authors, and published them and sent the, sent the books in great distribution in Latin America. And so I think all of them influenced me. I think um, it's so funny. I read so much about you. I know the answer to some of these questions. Well, answer, <laughs> answer. You can do that. Yeah. But I'll ask it because maybe other people are wondering the same thing. Um, would you ever consider writing a biography about your uncle Salvador Allende? Um, yeah. No, I, I don't. I, I don't think I'm capable of writing a biography about anybody. I have had uh, Allende appearing in some of my books. As a, car as a real person, it, he's also in this book as, a, as a, the real person that he was. Um, but uh, he's not a, a character that I can easily fictionalize, and he is. Um, and I'm, I don't write biographies because it, it requires an academic research that I'm incapable of doing. I, I can research an event. I can research a time but not a person's life, because then you have to be really accurate with everything. And I, can, I cannot do that. I don't think I could write a biography of myself, because I, I lie all the time. So <laughs> I don't remember what I said this morning. How can I remember what I've done in 77 years? Impossible. I can invent it, though. Um, it says, in tus novelas siempre usas Neruda. ¿Cuál es la obra de Neruda que más te influencia? Eh, eso es tu... <laughs> eso mal. O mal. O mal. <laughs> uh, we will trans you mind if we translate the question? <laughs> dele, dele. <laughs> well, uh, what, that in my novels often I quote Neruda. And what is the work of Neruda that I like the best? It depends. Because he, in this, for this book, I went to his poetry, for example, about Spain, España en el corazón, and um, the, El Canto General. Those, the, you can get a lot of different things depending on the mood. I read Neruda um, like a week before I start writing on January 8th, and that's because I work in English. Now I make love in English. And, which is not easy, and uh, it's not easy. Yeah, and, and so, well, I, I still make love, you know. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People think that because I'm old, I don't care about sex. 
I still do, not as much as before. <laughs> I'm not willing to, to do the crazy things I did before, but, but no acrobatics hanging from the chandelier, none of that. <laughs> but, um, okay, what was the question? <laughs> I forgot the question. I don't know, I'm still caught up with the sex. <laughs> I, I forgot the question completely. The question was, um, in your work you always use Neruda. Ah, Neruda. And what is your favorite work of Neruda? Yeah, so I was saying that I read Neruda because I need to get back my Spanish language. And uh, so I read Neruda aloud. And I get words that I have completely forgotten. The rhythm, the, 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 the tone, the color of the language. That is so important. Mm -hmm. and because I write in Spanish. So to live in English and write in Spanish, after some years becomes hard. Mm -hmm. I, I start translating from English and it sounds awful. Do you, but is there a particular book that you love or a, a poem that you I love? have a very used, torn uh, book that I have had with me since I was living in Chile. So it came with me in, in the 70s when I went to Venezuela. And it, it is the complete works of Pablo Neruda, Las Obras Completas de Pablo Neruda. And they are not complete because the book is so old that it's only, only some of it. Yeah. How did you, you know, I actually was wondering, how do you find books? Like, I'm curious, how did you find my book? Because it was all over. Oh, it was? Yeah. <laughs> it was all over and people were talking about it. And, and I, I thought, well, I, you, are, you are Latina and the, the book sounded fantastic. So, of course, I read it. So usually you find books, like, do you go to the bookstore? Yeah, I, I, there's a bookstore in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, in the county where I live, uh, Book Passage, and I go there every day to have my coffee in the morning after I walk the dogs, and they give me the newest things, sometimes in reader's copy, sometimes in manuscript. I read uh, the, the, um, the Kite Runner in manuscript. So, and, and, and I, it's the only time in my life I call the publisher and said, I want to write something about this because it was so, such an incredible mm -hmm. book. So I get to, to hear about new writers and new books, and I also am addicted to audiobooks because I commute. So I, I have a, a story in my car all the time, and I get have my reading in the car. Sometimes I pull over, and I sit there in the rain waiting for the chapter to finish because I can't leave the book before it's... I can't, I can't drive home if I have the book in the car. Well, I think we're done. Check the time. I, we finished the yeah. time. <laughs> thank well, you so thank much. Thank you, Angie. This was wonderful. And thank you. Thank you.